evening, wherever you're, wherever you're linking in from. Uh, welcome to uh, the Wildland Hazard Solutions webinar. Um, I'm an encapsulator agent, or excuse me, an encapsulator specialist with HCT, and uh, I am located in Nebraska, USA. A little bit about my background. I was a, a fire chief in the middle of Nebraska and battalion chief with the Omaha, Nebraska Fire Department. Uh, retired out of there for 20 years, but I've been a volunteer for, for many, many years in, in farm country, USA. And uh, most of my background and experience with, with wildland and wildland fires has to do with uh, farm country, no-till fires and field fires, and uh, wildland urban interface and ag interface areas with suburban communities. So, uh, so a lot of different terrain from wide open flat areas, which we'll talk a little bit about, grassland areas, canyons, hills, uh, things of that nature. Um, uh, and we hope you guys will, will share your experiences with us as well. So uh, today we're going to explore the wildland fire problem and look at how wildland fires are having a, a bigger uh, and bigger impact and they're growing and changing and they're costing additional lives, additional money and damages that's ever growing and also having a, a very large environmental impact. Um, we're going to look at some alternative solutions as to how we can rapidly extinguish a wildfire, prevent reignition, uh, proactively prevent uh, uh, communities uh, from being damaged through the use of uh, uh, encapsulator agents as a, a fire ignition preventative, and uh, also how the agent can help you reduce the concentration of toxins at the nozzle. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started here and tell you a little bit about our company, Hazard Control Technologies, based in uh, Georgia, USA, but we do have a worldwide distribution network. And as always, our agent, our encapsulator agent called F500, has always been fluorine free. Um, if it had PFAS in it, it wouldn't work like it's supposed to. So our agent for 25 plus years has always been fluorine free. We do have a global distribution network, uh, although we're located in Fayetteville, Georgia. Uh, we do have distribution uh, and uh, branch and satellite offices in, in uh, Asia, South America, Australia, Europe, and Africa. And we do have distributors throughout the world. So if, uh, if you get to the point where you're where you're looking for information or product, uh, you can get a hold of us uh, through our headquarters, through our website, and we'll guide you to the correct distribution point. So, <clears throat> whoops, I was changing the wrong screen. So this is a little bit of a picture of our distribution network throughout the world, and. Uh, uh, as you can see, we're in, in points throughout the world, and that's ever growing. We're we're getting more and more satellite offices and branches around the world, as well as distributors. So let's look a little bit at the, as the cause and effect, as well as the impact of of wildland fires. And uh, one of the big areas that's really having a big problem right now is uh, Canada, obviously the Nova Scotia area, as well as British Columbia and other areas. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and it seems as though no matter where you are in the world, uh, there's always a dry area and another area that's too wet. So, and that's constantly changing. So over the past five years in the US, the United States has experienced an average of $18 billion uh, in climate disaster losses each year. In 2022 alone, 18 climate disasters costed a total of $175 billion in damages and 474 fatalities. So uh, every year somewhere in the world, uh, someone's getting hit with a few more disasters than someone else. Uh, 
2022, apparently was the U.S.'s turn. So this year, it looks like maybe it's it's Canada's turn, unfortunately. <clears throat> um, so we talked uh, a little bit about climate change. No matter what the cause may be, the climate's been changing since the the, the Earth was born. So uh, it always is changing, and and like I mentioned. Someone's always too dry, someone's always too wet, someone's always having hurricanes and, and someone else is always having tornadoes. But uh, all of those forces contribute to the erosion of uh, wildland, farmland, brush, landscapes, uh, forests and communities and contribute to the wildland fire problem impacting one area or another uh, more than more than uh, one area, more than another, what I meant to say. Um, <clears throat> so as, as this problem travels around, as, as the climate gets warm and dry, uh, also seasonally, and we'll look at an incident uh, a little bit later on in the presentation that occurred in, in Colorado uh, a couple of years ago, uh, right on New Year's Eve, that uh, because of the, the seasonal uh, Dryness late in the season, in the fall and in early winter, uh, caused a very large loss fire that also caused some loss of lives as well. <clears throat> so human activity, something that we can uh, never quite get a handle on, of course, <laughs> always a challenge. Uh, but the World Wildlife Fund sources human activity accidental or intentional as a cause of approximately 75% of today's wildfires. And then the Northern Hemisphere negligence, things such as burning garbage, debris, industrial accidents, agricultural overspill, et cetera, and arson are cited. One of the big impacts that has been a problem in, in California, for example, has been down power lines. Uh, they'll have a wind event or something like that, uh, and that causes sparking at the pole. And the next thing you know, you got uh, either a wire down or the spark itself just drops off the pole and, and starts a wildland fire in dry vegetation. That's been a, been a very common, common issue. <clears throat> um, wildland Urban Interface or WUI uh, is what we call it here in the US. And that's where, uh, uh, our urban areas and suburban areas are built into otherwise forested and wildland and grassland areas. And that becomes uh, a little bit of a rub when it comes to human activity and those vegetation areas where uh, the vegetation, trees, brush, grass are susceptible to ignition. And you get all that extra human activity in that area, extra power lines, uh, construction equipment, uh, you know, even just more human activity moving, moving about, and uh, you're gonna end up with more fires. <clears throat> so the US Fire Administration reports that fire departments across the country are increasingly being called upon to wooey fires, a wildland urban interface. And again, that includes brush, grass, forests, and other outdoor areas. Uh, uh, US Fire Administration or USFA estimates that more than 60,000 communities in the U.S. are at risk, and and I can speak to that. Most of you here in the in the U.S. can uh, uh, attest to the fact that our communities become more suburban, and they they have uh, urban sprawl out into areas that were previously occupied by just farms or forests. We end up with with more uh, accidental fires, and and a few more intentional fires as well. Uh, controlled burning that gets out of control is often a cause of wildland fires here in Nebraska. <clears throat> No-till farming, uh, it, it's become just a very, very common practice in the last 20, 25 years here in the US. Uh, it's a way to, to keep the nutrients in the soil uh, when I was a young person, which was a long, long time ago, uh, right after harvest, they would till up the field or disc up the field right away. So there wasn't really anything to burn. It was just bare dirt. But nowadays, it's it's done completely differently. So 
that stubble is all left in the field. The chaff that comes out of the back of the harvester is all left on the field. And that stuff's very susceptible to ignition once it dries out. Uh, so uh, things as simple as uh, a burn barrel, burn barrel blowing over or uh, a spark from a combine or a tractor or something like that can, can light those on fire. And uh, in, in the Midwest here, it gets pretty windy. It stays pretty windy. So at certain times of the year that that, that uh, residue left in the field is very easy to ignite. This uh, video I'm gonna show is of a, of a no-till fire that uh, I actually witnessed. I witnessed when it first got started, it was a, a burn barrel for trash that blew over because there were high winds that day. And uh, I could see it burning across the highway by the time I called for the fire department to respond, it was halfway across the field on the other side of the road. So this is a, a cornfield that has been harvested and is on fire. And this fire, there were about uh, winds of about 50 miles per hour that day. And this fire went about six or eight miles in one direction in a matter of 20 minutes. So the farmers try to keep uh, tillage uh, equipment hooked up to their tractors in case these fires are to start, they can try to get ahead of it. Uh, and then one of the problems is that firefighters and farmers take extraordinary risks to try to get ahead of these things. And uh, it's extremely dangerous. Um, uh, there's a lot of uncoordinated activities that tend to take place. And last year in Nebraska alone, there were three firefighters killed uh, fighting fires like this. And uh, they were all either fire chiefs or retired fire chiefs that were helping out at the fires. So a little bit more about the scope of the problem. <clears throat> Since 2000, the year 2000, wildfires have burned an annual average of 7 million acres in the U.S. alone, more than double the annual average burned in the 1990s. So I attribute that to a lot of factors. Uh, number one, the practice of no-till that has really taken hold of the farm community. And a lot of farms are, are very, uh, they're up against wildland areas. So it might burn from a field into a canyon area, uh, into forested areas, et cetera, that are much more hard to access, and uh, they create a huge problem. Um, and then the other thing I attributed that to is, is we have had good economy here in the last 20 years, and there's been a lot of growth in our communities out into the wildland urban interface areas. <clears throat> so a little picture of the NASA Earth Observatory, you can see the, the map of the Earth. And uh, these are active fires in March of 2000. And then as it goes over time through the years, you're gonna see the, the concentration of fires as it moves throughout and around the globe on up through the years. You can see some areas get, get repeat business from these fires unfortunately, um, and it causes a lot of loss uh, <clears throat> on each continent. Each continent has areas that are obviously drier than other areas, so uh, they get a lot of repeat fires. up to 2016 now. Uh, looks like the African continent to me gets a lot of repeat fires in the same area over and over again. And we're up to 2023 there now. And again, the same, the same area, unfortunately, in, in Africa getting hit again.
So in uh, 2021, right at the end of the year uh, in uh, Colorado, uh, in, in the Denver area, just north of the Denver area, Boulder, Golden, up in that area, if you're familiar with that, with that geography in that area, um, it's the base of the mountains. It goes from the mountains to the foothills to flat mesas and then out into the grasslands. And then uh, happens pretty annually that the winds come down off of the mountains. They gain a lot of speed and they start to roll and uh, really uh, create a lot of problems. And when the vegetation is dry, uh, it gets into the trees and the grasslands. If any little fire is sparked, it turns into a, a big problem. So in uh, 2021 in December, an unprecedented wildfire displaced more than 35,000 people. And uh, it's uh, <clears throat> it was a catastrophic event. And I'll show you some, some data about that. So this was a lightweight, uh, brand new apartment buildings, lightweight construction, uh, built right near the wildland urban interface area, which a lot of apartment buildings in the US are. Um, when you build uh, a private home in, in the US, uh, it's usually in some kind of a nice subdivision with, with at least some protection and, and setbacks and distance around it. But in a lot of cases where they build apartments, they build them uh, with the back or the Charlie side, as we would call it, facing creeks, canyons, and less desirable property. So these, these apartment buildings were exposed and you hear a little bit of the radio traffic in the background. We're calculating we're gonna need somewhere around 2,500 to 3,000 to pay GPM per minute. Well, they're talking about the water flow that they're using and the, and the fact that where they're where they're actually flowing water they're using about 2500 to 3000 gallons per minute sustained and for whatever reason the uh, uh, hydrants in an adjacent area were were dead either if they're redirecting the water over there or maybe they had a failure in a pump or something like that so <clears throat> cause a lot of a lot of damage really, really quickly. Um, there were two fatalities. They were very fortunate with that, that there were only two, at least immediately. Um, uh, with, with a wildland fire um, and air quality, you always have uh, somewhat delayed uh, casualties as well because of respiratory issues and people that are in poor health already don't, don't withstand those respiratory respiratory issues very well. So you almost always have uh, casualties later on that probably go unreported in relation to the fire. So there were 1,045 homes burned, 11 commercial properties, 129 homes damaged and 35 commercial properties damaged and 6,000 acres burned. <clears throat> In uh, I missed one. one second. For some reason it skipped the slide. I got to go back. Oh, okay. Um, so the winds were 115 miles an hour and uh, sustained winds for the better part of a, a day. Um, I'm going to click on a link here. I hope it, it works for us and takes us to uh, a website that uh, I would recommend everybody uh, take a look at in their own time. I'll let it load here. If it will. There it goes. So this is a GIS product by uh, ESRI. It's a, it's a GIS company and they create a product called ArcGIS and one of the the newer features of ArcGIS is what we call a story map. So they took a story map and they created a facilitated learning analysis of the Marshall Fire. So it's it's a really, really interesting website. Got a lot of details about the incident and <clears throat> videos, 
dash cam videos, uh, drone footage, uh, a lot of stuff. So one of the things it shows here is the, the winds uh, and the wind speeds uh, related to gales, storms, hurricanes, et cetera. And you can see that the category two hurricane was kind of the, the, the area of, uh, or the range that the winds were in that day. Um, uh, obviously that would be very difficult to do anything and much less fight a fire or evacuate people. But uh, a good friend of mine um, was in charge of a hospital evacuation during the middle of a Marshall fire, a very big challenge. And we'll kind of take a little peek at that here. Um, but one of the neat things about this story map is you can click on these different areas with different videos, and it shows you on the map where they were, were located specifically. And uh, for the, the hospital evacuation, for example, you can click on that and you can read more about it. Uh, in that case, in this hospital, not a very huge hospital, 51 patients, but there were five babies in the neonatal intensive care unit that also had to be evacuated in a very short period of time. So <clears throat> uh, it's just a really, really uh, good website, good to read through, backing up a little bit because of we've got too many things going on. Now it crashed. There it came back. But it's got a lot of firsthand video, dash cams, things like that of, of different points on the map during the fire and during the event. So I'm gonna I'm gonna copy that web address and I'm gonna post it in the chat so that you can you can all look at it and at your own uh, on your own time. I can do that, uh, Dan. You can continue with the presentation. I try to, to put the link. Very okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Back to the presentation. Okay. So uh, from 1990 through 2019, the Federal Emergency Management Agency of the U.S. Uh, reports that there's 502 firefighter fatalities related to wildland uh, firefighting in one form or another. So take a little bit of a look at, a look at that over the years. Uh, the graph on the right starts at 2010 and goes up through 2019. Have a, you know, a fairly even amount across the years. Uh, wildland firefighting is inherently dangerous. Uh, in 2013, uh, uh, if you look at why there were 31, there were 19 killed in one incident uh, in, in Prescott, Arizona. Um, so uh, that year there was a, a, a bigger spike. Um, uh, we should also look, though, at that health and safety risks for wildland firefighters, which until recently uh, weren't considered uh, line of duty deaths when it when it came to cancer, but now they are starting to look at it, at cancer as being a line of duty death risk for wildland firefighters as well as structural firefighters. So, in general, however, firefighters do have a nine percent higher risk of being diagnosed with cancer and a fourteen percent higher risk of dying from cancer than the rest of the population in the US. Uh, this risk is even higher for wildland firefighters due to that, that consistent exposure to smoke with little or no respiratory protection. They're constantly being re-exposed to low levels of it. And then skin absorption as well is, is a big factor in firefighter cancer. <clears throat> so, uh, if we look at, at effects beyond the fire itself and after the fire gets put out, the World Wildlife Fund warns that the effects of wildfires linger longer than the flames themselves. And uh, even after the fires die down, public health is being impacted well into the future. 
Uh, every year, there are an estimated 380,000 premature deaths from respiratory and cardiovascular issues attributed to wildland fire smoke. So look at, at what's happening uh, across the, the northern half of the U.S. and the southern part of Canada right now. You know, there's a large uh, metropolitan areas that are uh, millions and millions of people that are being affected by uh, wildland fire smoke. Uh, and uh, it's, it's pretty significant. <clears throat> I'll show you a picture after a little while of a picture I saw from, from New York City this morning. It's a very dark case. So over on the right, you can see some of the scorched uh, foundations where there used to be homes and a subdivision and wildland fire can take out uh, a, a lot of lightweight constructed homes very, very quickly, especially where buffer zones are not purposefully uh, kept intact. And obviously we, we try to educate the public to keep a buffer zone between uh, themselves in forested areas and grassland areas so that they're not immediately exposed to the to the high flames and, and blowing embers, but uh, not everybody listens. And, and then if you have 115 mile an hour winds, there's not much you can do about it. So State Farm recorded between April 2021 and March 2022, which was the period of the Marshall Fire, uh, California made up 65% of wildfire claims in the U.S. The average paid claim was about $207,000. And then Colorado made up 24% of wildfire claims. Average paid claim was $365,000. And then Oregon made up 6% of the wildfire claims, an average paid claim of $211,000. So what we've experienced recently is some of these large insurance companies, and I believe State Farm is one of them, it's actually pulled out of California and said, nope, no more, we're done. So <clears throat> that that puts uh, a homeowners at risk and they have to go and try and find new insurance coverage and it probably can get very expensive at that point. Um, <clears throat> I, I would imagine most people that are that are on this webinar uh, enjoy the outdoors in one form or another, where they like to hunt or fish or hike or go camping. Um, the outdoors is important to all of us. So uh, the ecosystem gets damaged every time there's a, a significant wildfire, and it has a an impact on uh, wildlife. Uh, uh, takes a long time to come back from that. Scientists have requested koalas, for example, be declared endangered alongside it, at least six other species. Following the devastating wildfires in Australia, the World Wildlife Fund estimates Australian wildfires have killed or displaced three billion animals. Well, I don't know if that's all the way down to mice or you know what that figure includes, but that's that's a big impact and it takes a long time to come back from that and to uh, you know, reclaim that, that uh, environmental status that it once was. So when we can do controlled burning, we give the animals a chance to escape the area and then come back in when it turns green again. But when uh, the wildfires are accidental and over a widespread area, and then also uh, wind driven, uh, the animals don't really get much of a chance to escape. And for years, there might not be areas for them to, to come back to either. <clears throat> so, uh, talk a little bit about what's going on in Canada right now. As of Sunday afternoon, 4th of May, there were 108 active wildfires across Alberta with 31 wildfires classified as out of control. The wildfires have forced more than 29,000 Albertans, Albertans from their home. And that's just, that's just one province. So uh, I was reading a little bit about uh, the wildfires in Canada this morning. 
it it really sounds like it's you know for uh we've already had as many fires this year as they had all of last year and it's very early in the year so uh big big problem up there hopefully we can get some feedback from some of our canadian participants after a little bit so uh act we're very concerned about uh uh our Canadian friends, uh, our brothers and sisters up there. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of uh, clients up there. We have a lot of fellow firefighters, and, as well as the whole country's our, our next door neighbor and uh, wish them the best. This company is meeting with fire departments throughout the province this week, promoting a product it claims is safer and more effective in fighting fires than traditional foam-based agents. NTV's Don Bradshaw has that story. It's known as F500 encapsulator agent, a liquid concentrate used to battle class A and B fires. The chemical compound is being touted as a more effective substitute for fire suppressing foam used by most fire departments today. Its primary benefits, according to the manufacturer, are quicker times it takes to extinguish fires, the lower amount of water required, and the ability to fight fires in a variety of situations. Foam uh, is used to make a blanket or kind of a carpet over a fire. So it's great if the fire is on the ground, but as soon as the fire is vertical or three dimension, it doesn't work. And even the foam standard from an FPA said it's not suitable for three dimensional fire or running off uh, fire. Our product works best when it is in three dimensional. So it's a huge difference. The product is more expensive than its foam based counterpart. But Barassa says in most scenarios, the amount of F500 required is on average about half the amount of foam dispersed. And while foam based products no longer contain the toxic materials that once existed in the suppressant, Barassa says the F500 greatly limits a firefighter's exposure to known cancer causing toxins and carcinogens. We East Company is meeting with fire departments throughout the province as well. So, uh, some areas of Canada have recently started using F500 for wildland fires. It's been used extensively in South America. It's gaining acceptance here in the U.S. on a state-by-state -state basis as well. Um, some of the big differences between F500 and, and the foam agents that have been used is, is the ability to penetrate the canopy and get down into the, uh, the, the surface fuels and wet the surface fuels and prevent ignition as well. And one of the ways that it does that better is that they've got uh, not only lowers the surface tension, but it's got a higher molecular weight than water alone. It's also uh, got a higher molecular molecular weight than most foam products, and it doesn't get uh, blown away by the wind or float as easy as foam products as they're dropped from an aircraft, for example. <clears throat> a little bit more about the encapsulator technology and the science behind it. Um, so encapsulator technology is an, it's a fluorine free water additive agent that's non corrosive and it's fully biodegradable and we'll talk a little bit about uh, why it's uh, why it's biodegradable and how it biodegrades um, it's UL listed in the Canada in, in Canada and the US and it's compliant with uh, NFPA 18A. Uh, which is water additive agents for fire suppression and vapor control. And that, and then uh, it's also helps us uh, eliminate, or excuse me, deal with combustible and flammable vapors, liquid spills, and, uh, and helps us mitigate those spills. So it's really a very versatile agent for fire departments. Uh, although we're, today we're talking mostly about wildland fires and, and how it benefits in that case. It's a good all-around agent, which which helps fire departments out because they don't have to deal with two or three agents. They don't have to have a class A foam and then class B foam and then uh, an alcohol resistant class B. They can have one agent do everything. So uh, an encapsulator agent is a type of water additive agent. So we're still using water. We're just adding an agent to it that helps water perform a lot better. 
So one of the basic building blocks of an encapsulator agent is called the spherical micelle. Spherical micelle, uh, as it's formed inside of a water droplet, encapsulates or locks up carbon and hydrocarbon molecules, whether we're dealing with a polar or nonpolar uh, type of flammable liquid. Um, but it also does that in the vapor space above the fire. So if we're dealing with solids that are on fire, like vegetation, um, you're going to notice uh, a big difference in the smoke right away as we're absorbing some of those carbons and hydrocarbons that come back together as a result of incomplete combustion. And we'll show you a little bit of, about how that works in, in a little bit. But it also, uh, the spherical micelle inside of the, the water droplet, which is now modified somewhat by the uh, F500 molecule, uh, it helps to absorb heat. And we've got several studies that show that. Um, uh, uh, independent studies by people who were looking at things, for example, like lithium ion battery fires. Uh, uh, the scientists broke it down a microscopic level and proved that, that the spherical micelle helped absorb heat inside the water droplet. Take a look here at, at how the F500 molecule interacts with the water droplet, forms not only the spherical micelles on the inside of the water, but also coats the outside of the water droplet to help protect it from extreme heat. Encapsulator technology. The next generation of fire and hazard mitigation. First, we start with a simplified version of a single encapsulator agent molecule consisting of a hydrophilic polar head which loves water, dissolves in water, and a hydrophobic nonpolar tail which fears water and will do anything to get away from water. Once the EA molecules enter the water, they instantaneously and automatically orient with the nonpolar tails inward and the polar heads outward, forming millions of spherical micelles. Micelles travel towards and exit the nozzles, forming EA droplets. My cells nearest to the surface of each droplet automatically break apart. The nonpolar tails orient outside the droplet with polar heads on the surface, forming an EA skin on the surface of every droplet. In addition to the EA skin, there are millions of molecular spherical micelles within each droplet. <clears throat> so if you look at that water droplet, which is the blue thing that's supposed to represent the outside of the water droplet, on the outside of that, you've got uh, F500 molecules that are coating the surface of the water droplet. Uh, the, the polar heads are pointing inwards towards the surface because they like water. The nonpolar tails are pointing outwards because they hate water. So they're, they fear water, they're trying to get away from it. And then on the inside of each water droplet, you have the spherical micelles and they're packed into that water droplet. There's millions of them in there. And uh, inside of each one of those, you have the tails pointing inwards and the, and the polar heads pointing outwards because again, tails fear water. So they're pointing inward on the inside of the water droplet. And inside of the spherical micelles, you have trapped carbons and hydrocarbons from that droplet flying through the air. And if it's on uh, landing on a liquid fuel, for example, then it's encapsulating those uh, volatile organic compounds out of the liquid as well and inerting the liquid and making it not flammable anymore. So we're truly not trying to create bubbles. We're not creating a foam. We're not creating a blanket over anything. Um, the, other, the other feature of this that makes it really, really good for uh, natural vegetation fires is the fact that uh, it breaks down the surface tension. So each water droplet is much smaller and uh, is allowed to more uniformly absorb heat out of solid materials, especially porous solid materials that it can soak into. Encapsulator technology. The next generation of fire. I don't know what that was. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about encapsulation a little bit. Uh, 
is the, the first superpower, I call it, of the encapsulator agent. Encapsulation uh, drastically reduces the risk of reignition and provides unpre unprecedented long-term and stable burnback resistance, whether you're talking about a flammable liquid or something like natural vegetation as you spray it on there. <clears throat> Uh, an encapsulator agent uh, works on a molecular level. It alters the chemical makeup of plain water. The fuel is driven towards the inside of the spherical micelles, and that's where the encapsulation occurs, and it provides a lasting effect. It, it, it locks up those carbon and hydrocarbon molecules inside of the spherical micelle until they either evaporate or if they are on soil or in a natural body of water, they get eaten by microbes. And microbes are at least 100,000 times larger than a spherical micelle. And uh, it's actually healthy for the uh, uh, microbes to eat the spherical micelles and it, in, it increases microbial activity. So it's, it's uh, an environmental benefit compared to plain water, which doesn't do any of that. So NFPA 18A section 7.7 .7 deals with what we call the spherical micelle stability test. Uh, the test procedure is to evaluate the ability of a water additive solution, which F500 is, it's not foam, it's what we call a water additive, to form and maintain a stable spherical micelle and encapsulate those combustibles and flammable liquids, rendering them non-flammable, non-ignitable, and not explosive, and maintaining that encapsulation even in the presence of high heat, such as direct flame contact, um, flammable metals, uh, smoldering materials like coal, uh, or coals from a fire from a tree that has burned down, uh, those, those spherical micelles maintain stability in the presence of high heat, and they don't release those carbon and hydrocarbons again into the atmosphere uh, until they naturally evaporate or are eaten by soil microbes. So it's a long lasting effect. firefighter did there, <clears throat> put down some flammable liquid. Uh, they treated a stripe in the middle with some F500. They inerted that fuel uh, in situ right where it was at. They left the fuel on both sides to be volatile yet, so those easily ignited. What was in the middle did not ignite, and they added a little bit more. At, but what the first test showed you is that we've encapsulated those molecules. They're resistant to high heat from the flame being right next to it. One of the uh, limitations, uh, things that breaks down a foam blanket is high heat from adjacent flaming and open burning, hot steel, et cetera, that'll break down a foam blanket and cause it to uh, reignite. <clears throat> but with F500, it doesn't, uh, especially with a surface still like this. Um, and then I uh, went in and treated the areas that were burning, narrated the fuel, uh, there encapsulated them. And then as you can see, the firefighters trying to reignite them with no luck. 
also walking through it, disturbing it. But since it's not a blanket, you can disturb it all you want. It's not going to catch on fire again. It's encapsulated. So it just shows the ability of encapsulation to, to resist burn back, permanently cool, permanently put things out. Um, and although this is a flammable liquid, those, those same principles apply uh, to solid fuels. Uh, got excellent burn back resistance, uh, which we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit more about as we go along. Rapid heat reduction. <clears throat> so encapsulator agent droplets uh, create what we call a thermal convergence, con excuse me, a thermal circuit using something called thermal conveyance. So the outer skin uh, uh, drives or absorbs heat into the in internal portion of each droplet without creating a scalding steam. And can attribute that somewhat to the high molecular weight as well as the, the altered structure of the water droplet with the, with the nonpolar tail sticking out and then the spherical my, micelles on, on the inside helping to absorb that heat, the increased surface area from the smaller water droplets, all that works together to help more uniformly absorb heat than plain water alone. <clears throat> so, uh, although we use a lot of plain water in the fire service and firefighting and even in wildland areas, plain water is somewhat inefficient at cooling because the molecular weight of a plain water droplet is low. It quickly converts the thermal energy into a scalding steam, but what doesn't get converted because of a low molecular weight, it just runs off really easy without uh, absorbing any heat. <clears throat> the thermal conveyance, which I meant, mentioned, uh, the molecular weight of an encapsulator agent, much heavier than plain water, approximately 50 times heavier. This in conjunction with the encapsulator agent's higher boiling point creates a thermal circuit uh, resulting in the, in the thermal conveyance. No scalding steam is generated, just, uh, uh, just a warm water vapor. And that's because uh, it only turns warm because it's more uniformly absorbing it and not just absorbing it in concentrated smaller batches like water would. So what this video is gonna show us is uh, number one, uh, burn back resistance in wood materials. So the, the stack of pallets on the left has been pre-treated with F500. The stack on the right is going to be ignited and burned and you're gonna see that it it doesn't burn into the stack of pallets on the left. And we're gonna extinguish it. They're gonna come up and touch it with their bare hands fairly quickly, showing that it cools very, very rapidly and effective. And then the last thing you're gonna see is that uh, we can't reignite it. So once it's been treated. Oops, standing on the wrong screen. Stand by. The hazard when you get more than one screen. Skip ahead a little bit on this because unless we're just watching pallets burn. You see, we got about a thousand degrees there with the thermal uh, infrared heat gun. Yes, the pallet in the left was pre treated then with 1%. Yes. Yeah, with 1%. Typically we're using 1% or maybe a little less, less for uh, natural vegetation, wood, paper, pulp, things of that nature. Class A materials. Go back a little bit. All right, it's gonna extinguish it here with 1% off 500. You see quite a bit of vapor coming off of there initially. Uh, it's just because it, it absorbing that heat 
very uniformly and a very small water droplet. Making sure we're hitting all slides. What you're going to see next is uh, uh, Ron Lowry, who's on the presentation with us today, walk up there and put his bare hand on one of those pallets that was just burning. So it cools that rapidly. Everybody else comes up there and, and does the, the bare hand challenge. Okay, what we're gonna do next here, we get an overhaul in there a little bit. An attempt attempt to, to relight pallets uh, and also attempt to light the pallets on the left that were pre-treated. And you're gonna see a little bit of flaming uh, when we have the flame directly impact those pallets. But as soon as we take the direct flame away, the pallets go right back. The fire stops burning. It won't sustain combustion. That's because the, the capsulator agent has soaked into the, the fibers of the wood and it absorbs heat very, very well and encapsulates gases and things like that. It just inhibits the ability for that product to combust. That high molecular weight plays into that as well. It, it, it's a very persistent uh, agent as it hangs around inside of the fibrous materials. So this demonstrates in one respect, how and why it can be used as, as a fire retardant or fire preventative and a natural product. This effect can last up to a couple of weeks in some cases. So you got it to flame there for a second, but then it went right back out. Now he's trying to light the, the unburned pallets. Again, you get some flaming surface combustion. But as soon as he takes the the driving force of the direct flame away, those flames go right back out. <clears throat> so this is one of the more uh, difficult to explain concepts, uh, but it's the third superpower of, of F500 and that's free radical interruption. So, as incomplete combustion occurs, free radicals are formed in the air in the vapor space right above the fire. And free radicals are in, in uh, molecules with an imbalance of electrons. And they're, they're, uh, since they're unstable, they're looking to restabilize by mating up with another type of molecule. And from that, they form uh, the, the compounds that we know exist in smoke. So carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, and a whole list of other really, really a rainbow of bad chemicals. And those chemicals are not only uh, flammable and cause the, the fire to grow and, and in a compartment, uh, uh, they cause that fire to uh, have a lot of buoyant fuel and eventually roll over and flash over. Um, but uh, they're also very, very toxic, and those are some of the things that cause firefighter cancer. So uh, <clears throat> that inhibition of that uh, free radical uh, coalescence, we call it, when the, when the free radicals coalesce or come back together, they form new compounds. And F500 interrupts that process uh, with the high molecular weight. <clears throat> So this is a tire fire. Um, 
as we all know, we've all probably seen tires burn before. They put off a lot of really, really black smoke, and that's because there's several quarts of oil that make up the tire. So as that's uh, uh, as it's burning, it's a perfect example of what happens when free radicals are allowed to coalesce. They create a really dark, acrid, thick, flammable smoke. First thing he's going to do is check and make sure that he's got F500 in the stream. And this is very important as we're as we're teaching and training about the use of F500 before you make your fire attack. Make sure you've got F500 in the stream, and then as the the tire fire is attacked, not only does it go out quickly, but pay attention to, to what happens to the atmosphere immediately above the tires. Yeah, 500 has just a milky appearance there. So we froze it there. We ended the video there. Tires are going out, but what we really wanted to portray with this video was the interruption of the coalescence of free radicals. So immediately, as soon as it's applied, there's no more smoke. Got a little water vapor coming off of, of the tires. There'll be a little bit more as we uh, keep applying the F500, and then it'll dissipate as well. But you notice no more smoke. So that's an important feature for firefighter uh, answer reduction, toxin redu reduction at the nozzle. Uh, whether you're talking wildland firefighting, uh, putting a car fire out, or putting a structure fire out. So Clemson University in 2006 uh, did, a, did a study of F500. And uh, they took, took an inverted glass funnel and they burned some toluene, which is a, a form of rubber, uh, underneath the glass funnel. And they, they sprayed uh, plain water across the, the vapor space of that, of that combustion three times. And they measured uh, the volume output of, of smoke, the visibility, the toxicity of it. And then they measured the accumulated toxic soot on the glass by weight. Um, then they did the same thing with 3% of 500 in water in a solution. Uh, again, the same burning toluene sprayed it across the, the, the column of, of smoke coming off of the burning toluene. And what they found was with the F500, they had a 97% decrease in the accumulation of toxic soot on the glass. They had a 98.6% decrease of toxic smoke and toxins in the smoke column. And then they had a 68% increase in visibility. So all of those are, are positive elements when we come, uh, when it comes to fighting a fire, uh, especially on the interior. So uh, uh, last year, uh, Laval Canada did a study on structural firefighting, structural interior firefighting. And uh, they did this study to uh, re reduce carcinogen exposure or to, to prove that carcinogen uh, exposure was being reduced by F500. And they did that uh, in memory of uh, uh, a firefighter that had passed away on November 3rd, 2020, and was Langis Villanueva. And he was 54 years old, but it wasn't their first a uh, firefighter that had, had died because of cancer. And obviously that's a problem in the fire service in general. So this study was very significant. So they had this farmhouse and I'll just play the video while I talk about it a little bit. Uh, and uh, Laval is not a small town. If you don't know, Laval is about 400,000 people. And uh, <clears throat> so it was very impactful study. Again, they did kind of like they did at the Clemson. Uh, uh, in the Clemson study, they did three attacks on the interior of plain water, excuse me, two, and then two with F500, and then one exterior. And you're viewing right now is the exterior attack. So if you're looking at a transitional attack, uh, for example, 
you're going to see the impact of F500 at 1% on the amount of smoke present, as well as the fire, how it, it, it uh, really has a, a, a significant impact on the fire when uh, you attack from the exterior as well. But what they did find, we'll, we'll see in the next slide, is a big reduction in the accumulation of toxins on firefighters turnout here. Uh, as a result of the study when F500 was used for initial interior fire attack. Now, if you attack with plain water and then you put it out with F500, kind of like you might with a Class A foam, you're still getting the same carcinogen load that you always did. But if you do your initial attack with F500, you're reducing the accumulation of uh, those volatile organic compounds on your turnout gear which relates to skin absorption because you've got to take that gear off. Someone's got to handle it and wash it. Uh, same thing happens in wildland firefighting. You know, probably get more dirty in wildland firefighting than you, than you even do in structural firefighting in a lot of cases. So uh, that, that soot accumulation on your skin, it absorbs in. The skin is warm. It's 400 times more absorbed. That has more, uh, how do I say this? It's 400 times more absorptive than cool skin. If you, uh, if any of you have been, look at this. Well, that F500, you can see it was a very short attack, and it doesn't only have that initial knockdown, you're going to see that it keeps working. And the next thing you know, there's a lot of uh, heat removed from that fire. You've got that tan water vapor coming out. And then you're going to see it really clear up on the interior. He's not even hitting the interior there. He's just hitting the eaves just to make sure it didn't uh, auto expose into the eaves. You're going to see a big significant impact as that room clears out. There's not going to be uh, near as much smoke or hardly any fire in there just from that very short attack. <clears throat> and they let it they let it get going again. They do it a couple of times, but that that's not steam, that's a, it's a tan water vapor. It's actually very comfortable. It's like being in a warm shower and it won't scald you. So it won't scald the victims either. Now from this study, what they found uh, was uh, a big reduction in what we call PAHs or poly, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And those hydrocarbons are the ones that are known to cause cancer in firefighters, not only through respiratory tract. We're protecting our respiratory tract in structural firefighting with, with self-contained breathing apparatus, but a lot of it's through skin absorption. So the results uh, from the measured, let me zoom out just a touch. So these are measurements uh, both without encapsulator agent in the first column on it, on each side of the chart, and then uh, with encapsulator agent. So we had two interior attacks without F500 and two interior attacks with F500. And these were the two that were measured and, and the way they measured it to be scientific is they used a protective hood, a brand new protective hood on each fire attack, as well as a brand new helmet liner. And they took the protective hood and they bagged it immediately after the fire attack and they took it to a lab at the University of Ottawa to measure all these, these amounts. So as you're gonna see like naphthalene, for example, you had a 71% decrease in the accumulation of naphthalene on the, on the hood. Uh, 
same with most of these. You had a big reduction in most of these. The dibenzo thiopine was a very small amount to begin with. That one was a 0% change, but that was a rarity. Most of all these uh, changed significantly. Um, the, the, the lower sign with the DL, that's below detectable limits. That's what that indicates. So uh, the benzenes are one of the big uh, problem areas that it's assumed. And with this benzo anthracene, they had a measurable amount. And then on the sec at, with the F500, they had no measurable quantity. They had one, this retein, that uh, they did have uh, uh, a slight increase for some reason on the second attack only. So, uh, but everything else was either a, a very large reduction or uh, stayed the same because it was a very low amount to begin with. So the conclusion from the committee that was studying this, the committee of the Laval Fire Department, was that the committee is confident that the encapsulating agent reduces firefighters exposure to carcinogenic contaminants. Furthermore, its use is also effective for class B, class C, class D fires, while water should not be used on these fire categories. For those reasons, we are moving forward with the use of encapsulating agent to prevent cancer in the Laval Fire Department. Fourth superpower of F500 that it is that it's eco-friendly. <clears throat> um, since there's no fluorinated agents in there, uh, uh, that's a big plus. Again, uh, fluorine or PFAS was intentionally added to foam products, intentionally added to keep the foam and the bubbles separate from the fuel and to keep the water from draining out of the bubbles and going into the fuel. So that PFAS was intentional. It was very effective also, and it made the foam work very well. Unfortunately, it's it's really, really bad for people and really, really bad for the environment. And we're going to find it for, for decades and decades to come in our drinking water and everywhere else. So, But as I stated earlier, F500 doesn't have any of that, wouldn't have any of that because it would make it not work. So it's never had any of that in its 25 plus year existence. <clears throat> oh, Arizona. Uh, Arizona recently, uh, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality recently named uh, F500 as the agent that they were going to fund in their uh, foam take back program. So uh, the Department of Environmental Quality in Arizona uh, pays for F500 to be used uh, as a replacement agent for. Uh, various types of foam, all the fire departments in Arizona. And the reason why they chose it is because it was the firefighter's choice. So I'm going to look here at uh, another GIS website. Oh, this one's an article. <clears throat> um, Shell Labs has done testing for us on our agent uh, to make sure it's fluorine free. Uh, again, this was. Uh, Arizona Firefighters Choice. Um, one of the big reasons uh, they chose it is because it's a versatile agent, works on all these classes of fire and lithium ion batteries. And Arizona has a very sensitive environmental situation um, uh, with all the sandy soils, cactus, the, their flora and fauna, as well as their wildlife there. It's very sensitive to any kind of chemical in that. In that uh, soil environment they have. So F500 is a very good choice for them because as it's treating a spill or gets used on a fire, if it gets into the soil, the microbes are going to eat it. It's not going to have a lasting harmful effect or a presence. So it's, it's a great agent to replace this one. <clears throat> F500 is, is listed in the EPA's National Contingency Plan as a surface washing agent. What that means is 
not that they endorse it, but they allow you to use it for a surface washing agent in the case of a, of a spill. Uh, and you got to be a little bit careful about it and make sure it's permitted use as if it gets into a waterway or it could get into a waterway. You have to have an EPA permit. <clears throat> but it's still frequently used for that. So um, when we compare uh, uh, plain water, foam, and other wetting agents to uh, an NFPA 18A encapsulator agent, we can see that with plain water, you have a high surface tension, which causes it not to absorb well in porous materials like grass, leaves, uh, the wood of trees, et cetera, et cetera, things in, in the natural world. Uh, it bounces off, it beads up, it turns to steam and runs off. Uh, the heat reduction because of that uniformly what uh, uniformity of heat reduction is very poor. With a class B foam for flammable liquids uh, under NFPA 11, the surface tension reduction is inefficient uh, and that surface tension reduction and that kind of a product helps it spread across the surface of the fuel, not soak in. Um, mechanical mitigation is, is poor. Uh, uh, and we have trouble maintaining a good foam blanket, especially in the presence of high heat or if the product is water immiscible or a polar solvent. And then heat reduction is poor. It actually kind of holds the heat in as a blanket would. Uh, a wetting agent by themselves reduces surface tension, efficient at that. Um, so your class A foams and so forth are, are efficient at that. The heat reduction is somewhat inefficient and then uh, when we're talking about a wildland use is they're easily carried away by the wind before they hit the ground and then they don't penetrate through the canopy and, and, and crown fuels very well to get to the surface fuel. Um, <clears throat> encapsulator agents, however, because we've got high molecular weight, it penetrates the academy, uh, canopy well, gets down to the surface fuels, good molecular mitigation rapid heat reduction, and free radical interruption as well. Okay, our last section uh, specifically deals with uh, wildland fires. And in this video, I'm going to show how um, F500 is applicable to wildland fires uh, in several different ways. <laughs> Here, what you're looking at is you have a pre treated uh, pine branches on the right. They lit the pine branches on the left, and we're looking at burn back resistance of the pre treated materials. Okay, we can go back just a second. All right, so if you look at the amount of calories absorbed per hour, the heat absorbed per hour with encapsulator technology, you're talking about 21 million uh, kilo, kilo calories per hour absorbed uh, versus plain water, which is only 6.6 .6, uh, million kilo calories per hour. So with with the F500, you're getting close to four times, close to five times, no, four times as many uh, uh, kilocalories per hour absorbed uh, as compared to plain water. And well, that's, that's a very significant difference.
the big things you're going to see both in this video and in the next couple of slides is that encapsulator technology saved the brigades that were fighting the Amazon wildfires a lot of time, energy, and resources, and increased the effectiveness as well. It makes water go further, makes the fire go out faster. It uh, makes your firefighting forces more effective so they can get back off the line soon. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, uh, different Amazon and South American wildfires that hazard control technologies has been involved in, and I'm probably going to uh, rely on Hernan here for a little bit on some of these to tell the backstory. Um, so Hernan, what can you tell us about the Bolivia wildfires? Uh, uh, yes, we we participate in the Amazon in, in, with the Bolivia firefighters. Our company give one thousand liter, and we spent fifteen days. I went to the Amazon to train the firefighters, and we can realize how they can spend less time, and they can start to be more effective in to extinguish the fires. I'm going to go ahead and play the video associated with that. Yeah, here. Yeah, if, if you go to the center, you can see how the people in. El aditivo agente encapsulador. Va a ser operado por el ejército. Cargar el agente encapsulador argentino como el ejército. Yes, after this video, you have uh, one, fire, one fire chief talking about. How they work. Estamos en la propiedad de San Blas. Estamos con un efectivo de ocho bomberos de primera línea, realizando el control de un incendio que estaba que había ingresado a la, a la propiedad la madrugada de ayer y a un nuevo sector porque ya la, la propiedad ha sido afectada. Nos encontramos realizando ahorita trabajos de extinción y control, eh, haciendo uso del del encapsulante F500, un producto que nos ha dotado la, la gobernación. Eh, vale recalcar que el producto nos ahorra bastante trabajo, ya que hemos visto que con mil litros la eficiencia de nuestro, nuestro trabajo es tres a cinco veces mayor. Entonces eso nos ahorra tiempo, este, nos ahorra desgaste, nos ahorra horas hombre trabajadas y obviamente eh, efectividad sobre el terreno. ¿no? Eh, estamos aquí más de más de 30 días ya. This is a, tanto aquí a person that works like a fire brigade. Vecina, ¿no? Pero justamente ahora nos tocó ensayar ese producto y bueno, lo hemos visto que es mejor que el agua. Tanto hemos trabajado nosotros con las máquinas como han visto. Hemos botado miles de litros de agua y no enfría tan rápido como, como lo he sentido ahorita. Entonces... Han visto que me he metido entre medio de las brasas, se podría decir, entre medio de los tizones. Y lo he sentido menos, menos eh, caliente que con agua. Entonces, nos ha dado buenos resultados. Hasta el momento, como le digo, es la primera vez que estamos utilizando. Uh, Dan, for us, the most important thing is that in the middle of nowhere, they don't have a lot of equipment, a lot of tools. They, they try to extinguish the fire what they have in, in place. Here you have an example, if, if you put to play, they, they have a big farms to, to protect. And the only way that they can protect was with helicopters, but they don't have pool. And the, the firefighters uh, has to use uh, the Bambi buckets and they have to fill the Bambi bucket in a, in a unsafe way. But in this way, when I, I say it's not a way, they can save the, the, the people inside of the farm. Okay, so they're actually filling the Bambi bucket with fire hose. Yes. Which had yes, to be kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, yes, if you, if you want to test or make this in Canada or USA, it's no, no way. But they say, we don't have other way to say these people. It's the only way to enter in the middle of the Amazon with this. 
All right. Okay. How about Chile? Ah, uh, yes. This this is in 2018. It was a big fire in Chile. Uh, it was a company that was hired for the government of Chile, and they have this uh, Chinook helicopter. That's the capacity of the Bambi bucket was 10,000 liters, and our distributor in Chile uh, donates 500 liters, and they throw uh, for each uh, flight 100 liters a liter of Asian, and they, they can record uh, with a camera and with a thermal camera that how they can stop the propagation of the fire. Okay, you'll see in this video as the helicopter yes. drops it, and then you'll have a, a little bit at the end with uh, thermal imaging that shows the, the yeah. cool zone created by the F-500. See here, they, they are using the product and they, they follow with other uh, helicopter to see how they decrease the temperature. If you see the black. See the cool yes. And the next, the next uh, slide was in Argentina, in the province of Córdoba. They, the government, we, we donate, and we start to, to test in, with fire trucks, uh, backpacks, uh, and the planes, the air tractors. When they started to, to use one of the pilot common, I mean, say, around this probably is amazing, because if you are a good pilot, when you hit the fire, you sting with the fire. But if you are a bad pilot and you don't hit on the fire and you hit in the sides, the fire can stop the propagation and the fire brigade on the ground can uh, finish uh, very easy the, the job. If, if you move forward, uh, Dan, in the next slide, you can see how they put on the on the trucks on the pickup trucks uh, inside of the plane and, and it was a very easy way because the, the air tractor plane has 3000 liters and they use only one pail of 20 liters inside of this tank is less than 1% is 0.7% but they have a, a very good solution in this kind of fire. When, when you see the, the amount of Asian that you have around each droplet of water, the weight of the droplet with the 500 is more than 1,000 mole per gram. And this is, is very heavy when you throw in uh, on a, airplanes that you can heat the fire and you can have more deep penetration. Very good, and that's what they found when the Georgia forestry tested with F500 is they they noticed the ability of the F500 to drop and have an impact on the fuel on the ground on the surface fuels and not float away or be blown away by the wind and and so the Georgia uh, Georgia forestry has approved F500 for use in Georgia in the U.S. it's it's kind of a state by state approval uh, the USDA. I haven't put it on their list because they only have a foam test. They don't have an encapsulator agent test. Um, <clears throat> so they haven't put it on their list of approved funded broad products yet. So in the US, it's more or less a state by state or, or region by region approval. Um, but uh, it does have a very good effect, long lasting effect, uh, as Fernand said, uh, even if the, if the aircraft misses the fire somewhat, it's still going to have a fire preventative effect on the fuels that it did hit. And, in, and that, if, that effect uh, lasts up to several days, in some cases up to a couple of weeks. So <clears throat> um, what we have to do as a society, take proactive steps that we can that we have available to us to make a difference. Um, this technology uh, allows us to uh, work towards an eco-friendly future with an uh, environmentally friendly product that there's not an environmental risk with. It also improves outcomes. So 
when you look at plain water, plain water doesn't really improve uh, the environmental impact or the, or the outcome or the emissions. The use of F500 does improve those things, whether we're talking about wildland fire or structure fire. So uh, we can reduce those toxins at the nozzle, we can reduce airborne emissions, and we can reduce runoff emissions as well. And with that, <clears throat> uh, that is more or less the end of the of the slide deck. So we'll certainly entertain some questions now. I'd like to thank everybody that participated today. If you currently use F500, thanks for thanks for coming back and learning more. Uh, but if you don't use it yet uh, and you need more information, uh, please reach out uh, and you have contact forms on our website. Where you can reply to Hernan when he sends you the additional information and we'll put you in touch with uh, whatever resource you need to get more information or purchase, uh, whichever you would like. Thank you.